My name is PJ and this is the Critical Criminology Working Group. And uh, before we begin, I also wanted to acknowledge the land that we're standing on as being unceded to territories and contested still. Um, in the north part, uh, Musqueam, all throughout the Kwantlen Nation, had run between different territories. In the south, Siamiano, uh, over in the west, is the Sawasan Nation's territories. Um, and this way, towards the mountains, is Katsi territory. And all of this is still contested territory. And just recently, just last week at Kwantlen, there was, many of you may be aware, the um, issues around Aboriginal uh, justice and seeking for the truth and reconciliation since the residential schools. And there was an all nations gathering here as well, where we had uh, the honor of a uh, Kwantlen elder to come and open the events. So. Um, we like to acknowledge that as well before we begin, just to recognize where, where we are situated today. So, um, with no further ado, I'm going to introduce uh, a comrade Black from the, the Victoria, from uh, Karma's Books, and he's going to introduce our guest today, Leila Abdul Rahim. And if I thank you very much for coming, and I hope, to, I hope to see you again on part of the trip later on. Thank you. Bye. Uh, hello, and thank you all for coming. Uh, you guys have a wonderful, gorgeous campus here, so I, I think you guys should be quite happy with that. Uh, I usually hate universities, and I don't hate this one. So, um, I'm an organizer from Victoria, BC, uh, which is unceded the Quantum Territory. I uh, came across Layla last year after she was interviewed on Anarchy Radio about her critique of Occupy, and I was just so impressed with it that I went and looked on Facebook, and sure enough, she was on Facebook. Here we are today, uh, about a year later or so, and uh, I finally got everything together. So we're doing a whole series of talks. Uh, this is the first of the series. If you find this interesting, please go and tell people you know in or around Vancouver, Vancouver Talks, it's only an hour away from here. Uh, she's speaking again in Vancouver on the 12th at uh, the Spartacus Books, and then again on the 13th at the Purple Thistle. So some of these talks are in unschooling spaces, some of them are in bookstores, some of them are in coffee shops, some of them are in universities. Um, and that seems quite fitting, and when you read her book, you'll see why. Uh, so, because it's very broad range um, of subject matters. I, I think that uh, there's a lot that she has to say that I don't hear other people saying, and that makes it very important. So, uh, I, again, Layla, uh, thank you for coming. This is Layla Del and welcome. Thank you for this introduction and actually for working so hard and making this tour uh, so interesting and fascinating. I'm happening. And, uh, well, yes, thank you for the space. And, um, so, um, has any of you looked at the title of the book and wondered what it has to do with criminology? Wild children, domesticated dreams, civilization and the birth of education. Um, and in, in my description for this talk, of course, I start with an example that is very, well, still fresh, which is uh, what happened this summer. Uh, with the trial of uh, George Zimmerman, his acquittal uh, in the murder of uh, a black uh, school boy, uh, Trevor Martin. And again, you think, what does, what does George Zimmerman have to do with the project of education and domestication and civilization? And um, I would like to focus on, on one aspect of, of the acquittal. The, the acquittal. I mean, we, we could argue, um, and there is a lot of um, uh, research in anthropology of law or sociology of law um, on how um, a trial process is a staged um, space, uh, theatrical staging of narrative cultural narratives, uh, predispositions, how they play into how the process itself, how, how we question the witnesses or, or, or the plaintiff or the, you know, how, how everything gets formulated. 
And, uh, and so there's this aspect that um, is relevant, but not to the underlying premise that I want to address here. What drives the whole staging, the whole questioning of is everybody, everybody knows the fact that, well, Trayvon Martin died. Trayvon Martin died because he was shot. And how we formulate the questioning, how we formulate the guilt of the killer. It's not that the killer killed, it's whether he had the right to kill. Okay? So already you see that what's driving the concept itself of crime and punishment, or, or the definition of a criminal, is not the fact that the criminal committed a crime, but whether he or she had the right to commit that crime. So you see where that takes us? It takes us to the fact that in a society where this narrative is important, by which such important decisions are being made, um, does not question the fact itself of killing. And it's very interesting. Uh, has any of you heard of Michel Foucault? Probably. And uh, particularly of uh, I, Pierre Riviere, having slaughtered my mother, my sister, and my brother. Any one of you heard of this insane book? <laughs> Um, so, Michel Foucault found a 19th century peasant, a young peasant, I think he was like uh, almost a teenager when he committed the crime, he was like 19 or 20, you know, very young. Um, so 19th century peasant in France, who's never been to school, um, kills his mother, well, slaughters his mother, his sister, and his brother in order and his rationale is in order to liberate his uh, father. And you think, what does that have to do with 21st century Trayvon Martin, George Zimmerman uh, trial and Zimmerman's acquittal? Um, again, I'd like to point to the what drives the narrative, how that process was framed, how the media talked about, and how now historians, including Michel Foucault, examines uh, uh, again this uh, this crime um, and how the the criminal himself because uh, Pierre Riviere Michel Foucault came across uh, Pierre Riviere uh, because he wrote this incredibly eloquent memoir while he was in jail on explaining exactly how and why he committed and when you read the memoir uh, first of all it's a it, it's amazing to people who believe in the educational project that a peasant who was never taught how to read or write would write such an eloquent memoir. Second, it's a murderer who writes such an eloquent memoir explaining exactly the narrative, the motivations, how, what led him you know, to frame and conceptualize of that crime as a liberation project. Okay? And uh, uh, one of the things I want to focus on, well, uh, actually two things. One is that the narrative, um, his narrative, was framed by him having read the Bible. Okay? And having read the Bible, um, he saw that there is um, a glorification of some murders and the criminalization of others. And the glorification of mass murders that occur historically through you know, monotheism, because Christianity is not the only guilty religion. You know, all uh, domesticated religions eventually commit uh, crimes. Um, is whether you kill for the right of the ownership of the civilizing project and historically we move through, well, you know, the lords of the countryside, you know, who, who own the land and then domesticate human and non-human resources to work on that land. But who owns um, what is produced? 
is the owner is the owner the landlord okay um, uh, slavery you know has this abides by the same structure uh, then you move uh, serfdom moves to nation state building nation and and through all of this nation state building moves to the contemporary nation like um, nations independent nations but nonetheless we still have the same narrative that frames us which is war you know war never went away throughout the 10,000 years of uh, civilization and so the question again in uh, in that narrative in the biblical narrative and then as it was acted through the 19th century France and French countryside and specifically by individuals who lived through that narrative those who accepted it, those who rebelled, those who tried to be appropriated. I mean, you still see the same tendency that the question again is not whether you're going to kill, abuse, rape, um, uh, dispossess. The question is whether you have the right to do it. Okay, and where does it take us? Um, so it's it's very interesting how the history because uh, uh, Michel Foucault's edition uh, is preceded by a historic. It's a collaborative uh, project, so there are historians who make uh, a really wonderful um, analysis of, uh, uh, of feudalism, of the feudal relationships, of the nation state building. Uh, but to me, it's, it's this aspect together with what the children learn. What is acceptable narrative in this civilized context for children to learn, after all? Pierre Riviere learned from the Bible, and that was his point. And in the Bible, if you go and commit murder, it's not crime if you do it for the right of the owner, the patriarch. And so to rid his father of the dead and you know everything, it was okay, according to that narrative, to kill the mother, the sister, and the brother. And you see, and, and it never went away. Because today we're dealing with the George Zimmermans. It's not one, it's just one example. Okay, so all that then I've introduced, you know, uh, these elements. Um, so how does it all relate to the contemporary school? A school in Edmonton, a school in Victoria, in Vancouver, in Montreal, in Moscow in Khartoum, um, Kuala Lumpur, anywhere. How does it relate to? Well, um, ten, and, and this is where anarcho-primitivism com comes in. What, what is this critique? Uh, has any of you heard of anarcho-primitivism? Um, so, um, anarcho-primitivism is a critique of uh, civilization. And I distinguish between, because there's uh, a lot of literature on critique of civilization, which is really interesting. Um, but my differentiation is that critique of civilization offers you a critique, and then you make what you want to make. It doesn't offer you uh, a direction or a solution. So after that, there are different attempts to respond to the critique, and anarcho-primitivism is one of these attempts to respond to this critique. Of you know, what is civilization? Okay, uh, we understand it. And is there a way um, to solve the, pro the big problems that it causes? So then I'll have to talk about both of them. So what is critique of civilization? Well, civilization as we know it today, uh, and again, I, I uh, come from the standard, it was, my education was British uh, system uh, in Africa mostly bit of Soviet history and because I was uh, born in Soviet Union in Russia. Um, but it was like standard British textbooks, you know, fifth primary, sixth primary, or just like uh, fifth grade, sixth grade. Um, and the very first history book as a child that I came across immediately introduced the concept of civilization. And it was very clear and evident how it was connected to the domestication of crops, to the fertile crescent, to the Indian um, new ways of appropriating the reproduction of animals, of 
hum of uh, well, humans comes later of crops, um, and uh, and maximizing the production. This is how it's introduced to children, and then we learn how to accept it, and we don't question it. Um, so again, what drives this project? Why? Um, and here is where anarcho-primitivism comes in, because it tries to look at, okay, if we're going to look for solutions, let's look at the resume, at the curriculum vitae of life on Earth. Okay, what, what's the history of life on Earth? How long is it? How long has it been? And life on Earth has been um, flourishing for billions of years. Okay, if we start from the beginning, if, if you accept the evolutionary uh, explanation, um, which, by the way, uh, is, does not, uh, is not mutually exclusive with uh, how a lot of indigenous people view themselves, or even uh, parts of monotheistic narratives. So, but that later. So, civilization then uh, comes 10,000 years ago with this domestication in the Fertile Crescent, whereas before that, humanity existed for millions of years. And life in all its diversity for billions of years. And with the domestication of crops and domestication of uh, human and non-human lives for work as resources, uh, coincides, or it's not a coincidence, but it begins with what we now term as the Holocene, the age of the Holocene extinction, the Anthropocene. Anthropocene is supposedly the age of the Homo sapiens, the wise ape, that suddenly um, invents a new way of living in the world, relating to the world and consuming the world. And this is what I talk about, the, the domestication project is based on, and, and that's what fuels civilization, is based on the appropriation of the reproduction and the exploitation of resources for the owner. And who is the owner then? You know, if you look at indigenous ways of living in the world, of knowing the world, of relating to the world. Um, you look at the legends, uh, I, like say, uh, Northern European, the Sami, or the uh, Inuit in Russia or, or anywhere around the world, you see that, for example, um, the transformation between animals is part of the reality. We are animals, we are part of the animals. The animals, the bear can become a human, you intera in interact with the bear. Um, there's no grammar that specifies that forever and ever one of these species owns the rights to the lives and the, pro and the product of the others. Neither the humans or the others. Justice, the concept of justice in non-domesticated wild societies and wild relationships is like the quantum mechanics concept of, you know, the, there's entropy, there's movement, there's, the, uh, there's change, and Part of our existence is constantly living and moving in that constantly changing space, tuning into it so that we make sure that diversity reigns because life without diversity cannot happen, it's death. And this is what monoculturalism does. This is where domestication happens. It becomes for one purpose of one species. Now I'm going to shave this forest and plant potatoes. That's monoculturalism. And monoculturalism has two aspects to it, which is um, the produce is one, but it's also the perspective is one. There's no more negotiation between the wolves. In the, the wolves, for example, in the Crimea come and attack, uh, they love watermelons, okay? So they come and attack watermelon fields, okay? And there should be a variety. Right? It's, sometimes it's the wolf who eats the watermelon, sometimes it's a human, sometimes it's someone else. 
But in monoculturalism, it's only one. And one group of those who own the resources. So you see how this narrative is, is framed from the beginning of that civilizing project as um, a project of not that you're going to shave everything and dispossess everyone, but whether you have the right to do it or not. And with that, like, um, a lot of problems uh, start uh, coming out because, okay, once you, this, you give one group of humans or, or beings um, the right to possess the reproduction of others, what does that entail? That entails forcing the other sexuality to reproduce. And you see that with plants, you see that with animals, and you see that with humans, because then immediately you have the, um, the division of labor, and the division of labor, the reproduction of human resources who will work for their owners becomes naturalized in that narrative, okay? So it's no longer whether, you have, whether rape has been committed, whether turkeys have been forced to reproduce when they don't want to reproduce, whether a woman is being raped for whatever other reason that the rapist defines, okay? So here, again, uh, that's not the issue. The issue is whether you have the right to do it, okay? And so, um, if, we start with, that, with the beginning of that project and we arrive at the 21st century North American education project. We see that these relationships imbue every interaction. The hierarchy, the way the knowledge is framed, regardless of how it is contested, the structure of ownership, the structure of the non-division of wealth frames these relationships in this way that even if the law will articulate that you cannot rape, you cannot murder, in the end how it all plays out in the justice system is the civilized narrative of whether you have the right to do it. Okay? Did Julian Assange commit his crime? Did the guy from um, the IMF, what's his face? <laughs> this is like <laughs> willful amnesia. <laughs> uh, can't even think of Strauss Khan. Okay, did he commit the... It, it, it's not the issue, it's the issue is, oh, you are trying to attack the character of a man who is needed in this specific position, and what is that position? That position entails rape, regardless of whether it's individual, it transposes what does IMF do, okay? What, um, it oversees the, interna it's the Mo International Monetary Fund, right? It oversees the, uh, that actually um, all nation states, their effort, their currencies are not valued equally. What does, what does that mean? That means that you, if you have to depend on massive rape in the Congo to force women to work for Coltan to make uh, cell phones and other uh, technologies, that in that framework, it's okay. Even if it's not articulated, you see that the justice system is built around the fact that it's this transfer of, um, of resources to the owners that is being maintained, okay? And non-distribution of wealth. And non-distribution of wealth is rooted in the concept of resources. Like you have these resources, you have coltan, you have women, you have chicken, you know, you have children, future resources for future labor. And so this, um, uh, the premises in this narrative are um, relevant to how then children are being domesticated, how, the, how children are being, um, now we don't call them domesticated, we say 
educated, right? And what is this, like when you think about the driving um, premises of education, what are they? What's education? You go into, do you go to a club? Do you go to a woods? To the woods? Do, do you go um, in a community? No, you go in a classroom. And what do you do in the classroom? You learn what the teacher wants you to learn. And sometimes it's interesting and good stuff. But in my book I argue what the interesting and the critical stuff in the end um, still obeys the structural parameter that in order for you to do well, you need to answer, to respond, to do the test, to the, the exams and get good grades. And the good grades is what it, is the reward for crime, of thinking about yourselves and the others in terms of resources. You want to get a job? You're going to go to a human resource department and apply for a job, right? So you want to be a human resource. And you hope that you'll have enough human resources to compensate for whoever you are going to be a resource for. So um, the domestication project then uh, frames all of our, our desires, our knowledge, and our paths in this society in, this, in these terms. And so my, my question is then, well, I don't have answers how we overcome, because now it's globalized, this the civilizing project um, and the domesticated project. How do we overcome it? But by, we, we, we have to uh, critique, we have to undo this domestication in ourselves and in the world. Okay, so we have to um, undo this thinking of ourselves and in terms of the world, in terms of resources, in terms of the right to commit murder. Shall I kill this chicken or shall I use this cow? Okay? It's, am I ready to be used and to use? You know, what is this concept of justice? And um, with the uh, hosting extinction happening, uh, climate change and deforestation and massive pollutions of the oceans and, and war, 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 and uh, uh, this massive industries. Uh, according to statistics uh, in da Daniel Dennett, uh, if 10,000 years ago when the project of civilization started uh, getting conceived and, and practiced in, uh, in the Fertile Crescent in the Middle East and then India, and China and then spreading. Uh, bio, uh, vertebrate biomass was like uh, in wilderness, the non-domesticated, was 99 or 98 percent and within 10,000 years it's reversed. Now the domesticated, which means civilized humans and all the domesticated species, the monocultural species, uh, now constitute 98% of vertebrate biomass on Earth, and only 2% of wilderness. So it's an urgent question of what are we transmitting to our future generations? What are we leaving behind? So I'd like to leave my uh, presentation at this. I think the I usually like uh, the discussions much more. This is to present you the ideas and the critiques and the concepts. And uh, I'm sure, like for those of you who've never heard of these things before, it's, it would be great to use the rest of the time to really like ask the questions, don't be shy. Um, and it would be much more interesting than speaking like, at you. <laughs> Thank you very much.
Should I turn off the videotape? I should. I usually ask if it's all right. Should yeah, I just, it, just leave it off? It would. It's usually actually more. In, the, the discussions are usually more interesting than the talks. I find <laughs> it's pointed towards her. Does anybody have a preference? If you'd like to turn it off, I don't. I don't mind. It's okay. <laughs> Tom, yeah. Okay. Doesn't have your face. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if you like to state your name, do. If not, don't. It's, uh, it's, it's up to you. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, do you um, do you believe that you know murder or killing another um, individual human being um, is is uh, acceptable in any in any framework. Excellent question. Because yes, like crit critiquing uh, the narratives and, and and leaving it at that, and especially yes, uh, find uh, the people uh, when you state that okay, uh, humanity for ten thousand years has been practicing this, and therefore. And many people use it as then an excuse that, well, you know, for 10,000, well, hey, for 150 years we've been doing this. That's it. We have to keep doing it all our lives. No, I don't think, uh, I think it's a problem. Um, it's a problem for several reasons. Um, one, and, and one is that this um, Anthropology of predation, or con constructing the human being as a predator, um, first of all, is not a genetic fact, just for the fact that um, we still have to keep talking about it, uh, that the medical establishment insists that parents feed meat or victims to their children it shows, and if you don't force the kids, the kids usually um, want to eat what our cousins, the prime, or even like some of our siblings, the primates do. Uh, berries, fruits, nuts, um, things that they help propagate. Okay, um, and so um, I find it really problematic uh, to build our anthropology or self-knowledge as human beings on predation. And so if you start looking, but one, but, and, and this is the problem, because when you, when you build this anthropology on predation, then in that narrative, in that framework, it's okay to kill human beings, because in the end, well, you know, who do you construct as a person? Who has the right to, to personhood, and who does not have the right to personhood? Who is the prey in this narrative? Okay, until recently, Black people were not even considered persons, humans, right? So it's okay to use them for work. It's okay to kill them. I mean, and it's still it's part it, it's part of this narrative. That's why it's okay to kill Trayvon Martin in this narrative. Okay, and obviously my position is that it's not okay because then how do we frame our anthropology and self knowledge? Um, we could, if uh, we, if we are meant to be part of diversity and community of life, then it appears that our role is to help life be and to consume that which helps this diversity. Okay, and then you um, you go outside the whole the the whole narrative of consumption because consumption starts with predation. And again, when we look at um, um, at this, our siblings today, the, uh, the primates, the, the chimps, the bonobos. Uh, the chimps, and, well, the bonobos, uh, it appears, don't uh, consume uh, so-called animal proteins. By animal proteins, and, and chimps sometimes do, okay? Maximum up to 10% of their diet, and the proteins are ants or termites. Um, so it's not like active hunting. And uh, a lot of the times when they do engage, the chimps engage more in warfare, it's when the humans are encroaching, the humans are killing the apes, killing the forests, 
taking it, uh, colonizing the, uh, the, the land for, again, agricultural uh, purposes. Then you start seeing that the chimps are perfectly capable of behaving like humans, like civilized humans. And think of war, and think of cunning, political strategies of how we're going to gang up against another chimp or another uh, group of chimps. Nationalism, identity seems to appear in non-human life when they are dispossessed, just like it is in ours. And so my question then, it appears that this is an artificial narrative that we are ensuring with everything, the political, the media. You can look at how in Pierre Riviere, how the media framed that murder and how the media framed George Zimmerman's murder. And then when you bring in how we frame, even as victims, we frame our humanity vis-a-vis -vis other people, non-human people. We see that it follows this narrative, and it doesn't have to. And it's not only that it doesn't have to, it leads to an impasse. It leads to an end, a dead end, literally. You know, so, so it's a very good question. I'm glad you asked. Thank you. I think one of the solutions would be like, um, you know, the consume uh, clothes made in Bangladesh, you see, like you're still in this framework of the relationships of dominance and your um, place in the food chain would not be as high up, like say in the predatory um, food chain, but nonetheless you have still enough that you consume now not in, in a kind of uh, metaphorical death or maybe prolonged death because okay you know the impoverished uh, uh, slave uh, enslaved women and slavery is still well alive in Africa by the way and other places of the world uh, I mean we, we, we're still participating in that right so how how to do, undo this whole anthropology and this whole now globalized uh, system of predation, which is really difficult. It's one of the things you definitely need to, add, to like to address, like how how and what I consume. But what's the hidden? And it's very interesting. Again, um, in the book I talk about um, an experiment. Okay, anarcho primitivism comes comes in here because it's an experiment by a guy who wanted to critique civilization. He's an economist from Finland, and he wanted like okay, there's a critique. Of civilization, and there is like the economic systems uh, that calculate, you know, the I was going to say GP, <laughs> it's like in an academic context, but you know, the how much uh, nations uh, expand, how much like, and it's like, oh, appears like, you know, just digits, like, well, you know, this year, um, uh, you know, the states owns. Uh, receives that much and owes that much and how do we like make sense of it all he's like okay let's see what is the real cost of civilization okay of technology of uh, of how we live and the real cost he says as an economist who critiques uh, civilization um, there seems to be um, unaccounted for energy how much energy is needed to produce something, to grow, for example, um, I don't know, one hectare of wheat, okay? How, well, how much energy and how much it yields back? Does it, does it balance out or are there hidden costs? 
And so he goes to the north of Finland. And this is where anarcho-primitivism comes in, because anarcho-primitivism, okay, so um, if you are going to critique civilization, one of the things is we need to go back to the primitive um, technologies, or no technologies at all. There is a problem with, yeah, uh, one second, there is a problem with the um, going back and, you know, and, and, the, and the term itself, and obviously me, uh, having grown up in Africa, who until, and my father is, I'm half African, half Russian, and so to me it's a, it's a problem because, you know, my other part has been called primitive for, and still is, <laughs> Um, and so, um, but I can see how certain uh, anthropologists would look at it in terms of strictly uh, advanced technologies with hidden costs or rudimentary technologies. Okay, so we can look at apes or birds can make rudimentary primitive technology. And again, like I said, it has, it contains this progress kind of aspect, but nonetheless. Um, he goes and he starts uh, starts off. It, it, the project was meant. Uh, his name is uh, Lasse Nordman. The project was meant to be to last a year or two. So he's like, okay, I start off with one goat because I need milk, or I need protein. It's like a horse to help me flow, um, and then we'll see where where it goes from there. And he finds like, okay, uh, to keep the goat hostage to his need of milk, okay, there's reproduction involved, constant milking involved, it's like a rape of the goat that takes energy from him and time for which he has to account, like how much is the, does that milk give back enough, same thing with the horse, to have the horse work, you need the plow, you need to feed the horse, you need to, to keep it, and in the end, uh, I, and to work the field, and to make sure there are no competitive species. That's another thing of monoculturalism. You don't want competition. It's yours, right? And so he found that the hidden costs, um, the mining industry that's involved to make the metal bid for the horse, the leather, he has to go and kill somebody to get the leather, you know, the reins. Um, the plow itself, you know, cut off wood, you know, all of these things, he found that the more you rely on technology, the more you, you have these hidden costs. And so if you want to go to a place that can, uh, a cultural place that can have diversity, uh, that is pleasant to live in, that is healthy, that gives you leisure and health, because this is why, like, supposedly, in school, this is why we pass these tests, um, get degrees, to have a good life, right? Otherwise, there's the death penalty. You will not eat if you don't get good grades, if you don't finish school, if you drop out, oh, how are you going to live? It, you know, that's, that's the thinking in terms of death penalty and the reward is not a reward at all. The reward is that you are going to give your life as a resource in order to feed this machine that is not viable because the expenditure is always more. Okay? And so how do we go to that place? And there are different, different ways. Well, the population problem obviously is a big problem. Like you, you can't have everyone go with Lassa Northern in the north of Finland. Okay. So how are we going to do it? It's a creative pro, like it, it, it's something necessary, urgent, and a creative project of diversity because in every place there's going to be different solutions and different communities, but it's an urgent thing to address. And that's one of the things, only one tiny element. Again, very good question, thank you. You had something. Uh, no, I, like, I really like what you just said and I agree with a lot of that. But just to, for like a definition, of, like I came in a bit late, so I, you probably already covered that. But a definition of anarcho primitivism, you know, like are you talking about uh, pre-industrial or pre-agriculture, um, just as in, like in general? Like, 
you sort of already covered that just now, I think. Yeah. But uh, okay, you want to specify? Um, yeah. Again, um, um, there, it's like also my critique of uh, a lot of how subject matters and historical eras and, and genres or literature or science or disciplines get covered is that you always have this kind of um, and that's part, you know, part of how you know, domestication civilization work, how you're going to know the world. So you're going to um, group things that supposedly have, this, these have in common, commonalities, so you generalize, um, and, and then you differentiate. So like even in terms of errors, the enlightenment is different from, um, from the Middle Ages, or from the Renaissance, or from Romanticism. Because all of these people, there was a project that's going on. But then you look at how the people lived, or how the people contested. The people continually contest and resist this domesticating project in different ways. Okay? And so the same thing. If I speak of anarcho primitives, anarcho primitives, okay, it has certain elements. Yes, how are we going to look for the critique civilization and how are we going to live in this world? But that's where the commonalities end. Because in, in terms of anarcho principles, some would say, as you have uh, pointed out, that, well, you know, predation is okay. Okay, sometimes it's necessary to kill somebody else. Be it a human, be it knowing. Well, war happens, okay? Or hunting. Hunting is necessary. Our ancestors hunted, so we're hunting, okay? Um, so there's this group. And then another group would say, no, um, let's go, you know, and become. So there are different ways of of dealing with it, and it's um, and it's important to have these debates because in the end, what matters is that the the historical problem. So there's no era to go back to. There's only a relationship. So in in terms of uh, crime, uh, I guess the main point is that the the exploitation of uh, be it animals, the land, uh, other people. Uh, yeah. The concept of resources and who, who, who owns the resources, that's what the talk was about, yeah. yeah. Who owns the resources, who has the right uh, to exploit, to rape, and to kill. I mean, this is, th this is the major problem. And so with some anarcho-primitivists, um, the issue is that, well, as long as you define them as non-animal, non-human, then it's okay, and sometimes it's okay. Look, indigenous people did it, um, but in in today's uh, structure, it's problematic because in today's structure, the indigenous people, even within this system, don't have the right to kill an animal. You know, this constant, like you know, uh, in Nova Scotia, um, you know, the, the the hunting rights, cause like you know, indigenous people are, are jailed, but then. You know, when they, when they do it in, a, in an area that has been designed well. Here, no hunting. But over there, go and kill and smash and, you know, and sell. It's okay. And then who's doing it? White guys. And they're the first ones to defend this narrative of evolution at man as predator. And I use intentionally man. Because women, in that, even though there's a racial hierarchy, they are still prey. You know, the white man is at the top of the hierarchy today. This is what the narrative, uh, how, how it frames. And these are the relationships uh, that I'm contesting. And the construct of crime and punishment and reward is built around these premises. You and I think someone else also had hand up? No? Okay. So if human beings are not inherently aggressive, and driven by the drive to, to kill and predate. How does our, our predatory relationship to the environment, how did this survive for this long and in so many societies? Why did it survive for this long? Uh, well, that's, that's exactly the point, that um, it's not a viable model because it, bri it, it brought us um, to, to the age of extinctions. The minute a society starts, a human society, because I'm not talking, because one, okay, you framed it really actually well, because a lot of the time people would frame it differently. They was like, well, you know, wolves eat rabbit, okay? I was like, well, are you a wolf or are you a rabbit? 
And when you start analyzing the narrative, you find that it's, it's so, this uh, structure of predation and food chain is so smartly set that actually in this society we're both rabbits and wolves. Okay? But rabbits and wolves are not rabbits and wolves in terms of prey and predator all the time. Okay? Predators uh, sleep longer hours, and again, you know, I bring a lot of um, uh, data from observations, of, you know, animal lives, ethology, um, biology. So, um, sleep patterns of predators, very long, they eat, they hunt rarely, and they eat um, also not that frequently, okay? The, uh, the digestion tract is very short because otherwise you get the bacteria, you know, uh, and it rots, so you need to poop the stuff immediately, right? So, um, uh, there's a lot of physiology uh, in predation that is involved to account for that. And predators historically have uh, herbivores and frugivores, those who eat herbs and those who eat fruits, have outnumbered predators, okay? And so, the minute uh, humanity, and again, it's a part of humanity, for whatever reasons started, uh, according to some evidence, <clears throat> it was scavenging, and then they thought, well, you know, why scavenge? You can, and then invented fire comes in at the same time, because we're not adapted um, to predation, and we're still not adapted to predation. We have the appendix, and our digestion tract has not adapted to predation. We still, um, we get a lot, like a, a lot of diseases, cancer from consumption of meat. So, so this all points to the fact that even in terms of our physiology, this narrative remains a narrative, and it's and it's liberating because when you look at throughout the history of humanity, most human groups, if they predated, it was like an extravaganza, and the the majority remained frugivore, herbivore, and um, gatherers. It liberates us that we are not genetically kind of predetermined. We're either made by this like wrathful God who's like go and kill and pollute, and we're not made by this evolution that like really is into this, you know, this whole predatory um, thing. So it liberates us. We can we can change the narrative. We can frame our relationships differently. We can undo the structure. But we've come to a point where it has gone so far that where do we begin? Okay, and that's like a communal effort to find that solution. Does that answer? <laughs> Any more questions? Yes. Yeah, I have a couple. I'll just ask uh, the first for now. Sometimes, uh, there, there's a, a criticism of anti-civilizational approaches that emerges that says that uh, to look at civilization is, is too general, it's, it's too abstract, it's ahistorical, and it assumes this sort of, this, some sort of spark happens around domestication at some point, and then it inevitably leads to, you know, where we're at now, right, on the precipice, possibly, right? But, so I'll ask you, Part of, the, uh, part of the criticism suggests that rather than looking at civilization, maybe, now I understand you talk about eras and I, I don't want, I, 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 I appreciate that, but maybe, uh, maybe looking at specific modes of production makes sense. So, so part of that criticism would be to say, it's not civilization per se, but certainly something seems to happen with the emergence of capitalist modes of production, right? With the development of capitalism, you see extreme forms of production, the sort of technological development that you're talking about, the end of the commons, privatization of the biosphere, and so forth, and of course, you know, genocide and mass extermination. So I'm wondering how you respond to those sorts of uh, those sorts of criticisms that, on the one hand, say uh, it, it's it's not civilization or that that's too overarching, and also 
is there, is there a, some sort of a rift that happens with capitalism? Mm -hmm. Oh, ex excellent point. And actually, I address it in the book. <laughs> and uh, uh, because, um, again, uh, it kind of also um, uh, goes back to my response on uh, Lassen Nordland, okay? Um, what happens uh, with capitalism is that, cap you know, what is before capitalism? Before capitalism is feudalism, right? And we're talking about Europe, okay? Um, there's what's happening in the rest of the world at the time, okay? Um, the rest of the world, there are sometimes, you know, this, um, Les uh, comes in French, like explosions of civilization, and civilization in this anthropological sense of um, domestic. Okay, uh, here I'll explain, you know, the, the the technicality of the anthropological sense of civilization. So, uh, with domestication of crops and human and non-human lives for labor, uh, it becomes necessary. You, if, if humanity seems to have, and, and not only humanity, it seems uh, movement and nomadism has been uh, part of the necessity of diversity, especially for larger herbivores, um, predators. Um, what happens with domestication is then, because you're involved, this is what Lasse Nordlund observes, like, you have only one goat and one horse, and that's it. You're stuck to that place. Okay? And that place, if you are engaging in monocultural mode of relating to, to it, you are expropriating energy, but you don't have the diversity, the community, to give back to it, as the nomads would do. Nom uh, they would, and even if nomads not across continents, we, we discussed with Conrad a few days ago, okay, there's nomads that went across continents, the Tawari, uh, but there are groups who didn't travel that far, but nonetheless, the seasonal migration from place to place, you are interacting and you are leaving, um, you know, you don't use everything, you're leaving enough for other forms of life or species, right? So what happens with domestication is that you are settled and at a certain point you deplete. If, if you keep cutting all, like again, you conceptualize in legal rights, in appropriation, in, pro, in terms of property, this is your land, you kill all the comp competitive species, herbs, uh, Pests, that's part of the vocabulary that comes with thinking in terms of resources and ownership. And humans, nobody can come to your field and take anything. And then you need slave labor because you cannot all alone work and produce and expropriate from that field. So then you need... It kind of, the project itself starts um, kind of realizing itself. Um, you need slaves who will protect the territory, who will kill for you, slaves who will work, um, slaves whom you consume in terms of flesh and in terms of labor. Okay? Um, and then you deplete, and then you need more space. Okay? So civilization then um, already starts with settlement, and that settlement requires that you have more population in an area that normally would not, would not have had that settlement, that needs this seasonal movement and these interactions and this diversity because every group of beings, human or non-human, different species, they have their own uh, trees work together, you know. There's communication between the roots, between what is going, how to, how to grow, what is going to rot, what is going to fertilize. Um, and once uh, civilization then kind of brings settlement, and settlement brings us to cities, and cities 
require that colonization, like eternally expanding colonization of more resources, more land. Okay? And it brings us to a point where you cannot, because uh, it's depletable. And, and again, it's Lassen Nordlund is really helpful here because you are involved in constant devaluation of effort, of work, and of what the land can produce. Okay? If, if there is no natural system of uh, reintegrating what you have eaten into, into the diversity of what comes next, you are working on depletion and that's devaluation of the potential of the cost that you could, uh, um, or the profit that you can obtain from, from your colonized uh, resources and land. Okay? And so, um, to look at, uh, so, so, so then the, the whole project of literacy, you look at uh, Jack Goody, um, Ong, uh, Walter Ong, uh, uh, Watt, Ian Watt, like, they all talk about how, for example, literacy comes, or um, writing down the abstract and yet permanent ownership and what the resource owes to someone else starts with that colonization of land, spread of cities, and civilization in the Middle East, India. These are the first alphabets, and it's not a coincidence. Okay? And so when ca capitalism is the symbolic and abstract uh, attempt to hide all you know, the loss of diversity, of the real cost, of the real price of this civilizing project. So you cannot look at capitalism as something that happened and depleted. Because what are we going to have? Like, um, if you're going to undo capitalism, well, you know, Soviet Revolution happened, Chinese Revolution happened, a lot of um, wars of independence in Africa happened, right? Uh, did it undo anything? No, because we have this narrative, and this narrative is now written in terms of who owes who. And it's constantly going, the, this who owes who is going through devaluation, hence the IMF. It's important to keep that devaluation going because you need, to, you need to have more resources, you need to extract more resources, it's more desperate, more wars. So, it, capitalism is, comes after the depletion of itself by feudalism. You know, feudalism, you know, comes after. There is an evolution in that sense, but this evolution is towards the end. So this, th this would be my response, I don't know if that covers. So feudalism is kind of like a decentralized version of globalized capitalism. Exactly. Exactly. And, uh, and you see how, how these, um, these narratives play themselves differently, okay, at different times. But it's always with domestication. Like you look at, for example, the Tatar-Mongol invasions. Okay, it was a different um, one of the first, like they they domesticate crops, they domesticate horses. What happens immediately with the Tatar-Mongol invasions? You domesticate crops. There's alcoholism. Okay, uh, there's pain, and there's the possibility of going out and globalizing this extraction of resources. The Tarmongol invasions of Europe, Eastern Europe, um, is, is, is one of these uh, civilized, okay, nobody thinks that, like, oh, you know, those, those wild Tarmongol, no. On the contrary, they were civilized. And that's why they did. And, and that was like a global system that got stopped uh, in the Balkans, so it didn't go to Europe, and, and then it could have it could have spread around the world, you know, Gibraltar, Africa, but you know it was stopped at that time. It was maybe a little bit more rudimentary in terms of that they did not use 
um, the explosives and, and all that kind of stuff. But it was a huge global system of capital. Except we don't think of it in those terms. We think there's no plastic cards. Yeah? Um, but taxation and the whole relationship. And then after that, all these little explosions. Here in North America, um, there were explosions of civilizations. But they were suppressed. The immunity system of, of the diversity of life around those was strong enough to suppress them, the Mayas, the Aztecs. So, that, you know, and recently there was discovered one uh, civilization in, in the Arizona area. Um, but they suppressed them. Okay, so they could go on. Um, but something happened in that civilization in the Middle East that, you know, that has brought us to where we are. And how do we undo that? Yeah. Yes? Uh, one more. Uh, that's, that's always sort of the question that we, that we want to have at the forefront whenever we have these sorts of discussions, right, is what, what, what do we do? What, what do we do about it? You know, it's, it's, it's great to critique things, it's great to have an analysis, but we use that in practice. And uh, anarcho-primitivism, the, the, the first part of that, anarcho, is, is referencing anarchism, which, you know, beyond being a philosophy or a theory, is, is a, a rooted movement. And so I'm just wondering if, if you could uh, maybe leave us with a sense of what are some of the, uh, the real world prospects or wh where do you see in, in the here and now of everyday life perhaps the sort of the, the possibilities for, uh, for, for, for turning back domestication or, or for, for the possibility of something different, something better, that something that opposes that sort of predatory uh, characteristics that are you know, nurtured in the current conditions. Um, I think the most urgent uh, and most hopeful concern, because, I mean, you can't go, like, to the parliament and say, uh, Stevie, uh, please can you step down, like, we don't need a prime minister anymore. Um, <laughs> he, he won't do it, right? Um, you'll be in trouble. So, um, it's like, it, the, the, the structure is there, but um, the domestication of children and the narrative we transmit to them and the active resistance of all the oppressive, um, the oppressive forces that allow for this narrative of, of Pierre Riviere and George Zimmerman to rule us you know, and, and how we relate to each other as humans and to, the, to our non-human siblings. So we're all part of this world. We're all part of the living and non-living essence, matter, of this world. That, that's where we come from. Um, and so um, all forms of resistance and active... Um, uh, uh, active resistance uh, is, is important, but it's going to be hopeless if we do not undo the narrative and the methodology of domestication of, of the people who are growing up right now and accepting this narrative and accepting their place in this predatory. Because they're always promised some reward and they're always promised that if you only do better, you, and this, this I'll, I'll, you know, I will go back to Pierre Fier. This is one thing he learned from the biblical and from, um, from the news. He's like, well, you know, colonial wars are happening and, you know, these French um, soldiers come back and they're rewarded with golden medals for having killed the savages. And the more you kill, the more rewarded you'd be. And they're celebrated for it. Okay, this, and so if you do as well, then you'll be celebrated too, and you'll be rewarded and awarded. And we do not make the connection with a graded math test or a, or a drawing competition with that. 
but it's completely linked to this, that you will be rewarded in this narrative of mass extinction. And how are we going to make these people realize that it's not going to, it, it's not a reward. There's nothing, like the ocean is dying, the forests are dying, you know, species are disappearing. So, so this is really urgent. Yes? I want to borrow off Jeff's question, expand a little in that, uh, like I know that you have a fairly good knowledge of uh, what people call classical anarchism, especially in the Russian context of Bookchin, when he came along, uh, the social ecologist Murray Bookchin critiqued a lot of movements, basically wrote hate pieces against everyone he didn't like, and in there he called them uh, for one individualist, but he said that, uh, that what he defined essentially as real anarchism was based on social organizing. And as much as I despise his piece, I think there's a, an element here that is worth pulling out of it, which is this idea of social organizing. So in the uh, syndicalist traditions, anarchist communist traditions, people organize into unions or they organize into something where they're working together to uh, be able to actually have that strength in numbers in a unified way to oppose capitalism in the state. Um, and with the primitivists, you know, like you got people like Kevin Tucker looking up in the bush learning how to make his own uh, bows and arrows so he can kill things, right? Give her so, the last uh, elk. <laughs> about this whole idea of having this social organizing and I'm going to throw a context before I pass the question to you, which is that right now uh, across Canada, the nation state known as Canada, there's uh, prisoners in various prisons that are going on strike. And the goal on strike is Stephen Harper in his uh, tough on crime stuff where he's passed all these mandatory minimums and bolted in second bombs into cells built for one and all this. He's also uh, now uh, decrease the uh, wage that they can earn, which the wage includes room and board, and was designed in 1981. The maximum wage has been 690 over these years. And he's now made a pay cut that cuts up to 30% from prisoners' wages, and they need that, obviously. And this puts me in a context of constantly thinking, how can we take action in solidarity with these prisoners that's not entirely symbolic? Like, Refusing to go to eat is not going to help prisoners sitting in jail. So um, the prim uh, context of primitivism, the context of solidarity and social organizing, how can we have a response? Yeah, well, that's that's a problem that um, again, you know, have people who take you know this whole um, Western knowledge approach that you know, well, we think in terms of. Uh, Disciplines and disciplines, then you know everything is separated. You know, biology is separated from anthropology, and anthropology is separated from math, and math is separated from art. Okay, um, when you you think in, and again, like from child, we're tra we're trained to think. Okay, this is a class on chemistry. This is a class on this. No connections between them. No connections between groups. No connection between what I wear and the people in prison or the people in Bangladesh or, you know, whatever. Um, it's, it should not be mutually exclusive. Uh, my, I have, my, my critique of both anarcho-primitives and of this whole concept of uh, solidarity. Um, and uh, it, it should not overshadow the fact that I really value both. You know, solidarity is really important. Community organizing is really important, but at the same time, it's um, it's kind of a European thinking, and I'm a native of both. I'm a native. I'm born in Russia, you know, European, and as you mentioned, you know, this whole um, the revolution is, you know, is my heritage. The World War II, Soviet, you know, camp is my heritage. You know, I'm native in that. Um, but there's a problem with it when I look at it from my African side. Okay, my African side is that um, in Africa there was uh, solidarity and community and anarchy was a way of life until the European discovery of the continent. 
Okay? You you didn't need to organize because this is how life was. This you your livelihood depends on the fact that this community thrives and makes sure that every living community, human or non-human, thrives. Okay? You don't need to organize it because this should be self-evident. And children that are not schooled, if you leave them alone, if you leave them to learn through just interacting, they have empathy, they have compassion, and a desire to live in this in, in diversity. Okay? So again, uh, you don't need but in this context, in this colonized context, obviously, uh, you know, we can't say like, well, let's have a society like the Semai or like yeah, in Malaysia or like in Africa because even in Africa it's not happening anymore because we're all part of this trickle-down food chain, you know, predatory food chain and um, nation-state violence. We're all part of it, okay? So then, yes, organizing is really important. It's Organizing is helping right now, it's not a solution, but it's really important to have people who have done something and are being punished that they are not left alone because we are comfortable and we are afraid to lose something. It's really important. And how not to forget all these elements and to keep in mind that everything is interconnected. You know, it's 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 really important. So I'm really glad yeah, you brought this up. Well, I realize that some folks have to uh, go for uh, night classes and things like that. So I certainly don't want to uh, hold you up. Thanks to everyone for your uh, for your questions and your comments, and thank you especially for uh, sharing. With you. Thank you. Yeah, I didn't mean to rush folks along. I just <laughs> I recognize that some people have to go, so I just wanted to give them that space.
turn yes. them into a monster. And I think that's kind of what we're doing now is we're putting this big label on them and saying, you can do this because they're not being I think we see that all over the place yeah. too, not yeah. just in offenders. But um, with uh, Wild and Freeborn, we did Anarchy Radio uh, or Burn, I don't remember which one, but you could find that talk. I had a really great uh, discussion on the prison, the connections between the experiment, the prisoner's uh, dilemma. Uh, no, it wasn't the prisoner's dilemma, but, but it was the prisoner's, um, you know how when there was an experiment to have guards and prisoners? Yeah. So that, connect, and we connected it to um, how children, um, the marshmallow experiment. Uh, so you can, you know, listen, like how the marshmallow experiment nobody like people think actually like most of the comments like oh how cute those kids are and how they don't see how connected it is to this really brutal mm -hmm. you know dehumanizing you know how, how how quickly in that structure people are ready to deliver pain or to be you know to be cruel and, and, and to keep hostages and, uh, to abuse, it's, it's like so, you know, food, the reward and the, um, and the punishment are completely like one part of the, like two sides of the same coin. Mm -hmm. Excellent point, which is... Maybe you could, uh, if you have a link to that, maybe you could send it on to me and I could forward it to, to folks who are in the class. Yeah, maybe I should have put, uh, my, uh, it, the, the link is on my website. Okay. Um, and it's uh, probably, I, it, the, there were, if you have to see, I think it was Naked Wildness, uh, the title. Uh, but there were a few talks uh, I did with Wilden, and then, um, so, so one of them. Well, I, I give a reminder. Yeah, of, yeah. Of the I'll, site of where people can find Yeah, it. yeah. And uh, I'll, I'll look if I get yeah, the exact, I'll send it to you exactly. And maybe if, uh, maybe if, if somebody wants to follow up, drop an email or something. Of course, of course. Continue yeah. discussion that way. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. There was a prisoner, uh, Walter Bond, uh, who is an uh, ALF prisoner in the U.S. and had a bunch of support for him. He talked, well, actually, originally thought this was Mark Jacobs, yes, but Walter expanded on the idea that with the that he was in that state, a lot of the yeah. time yeah. stuff that he was. Mine tend to keep on my face. Whereas animals that are not domesticated, we use as a uh, predatory. And you're awesome. <laughs> and you too, I checked out your work. Oh, <laughs>